Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Oracle Modern Customer Experience 2017. Brought to you by Oracle. Hello and welcome back to the Oracle Marketing Cloud. Modern CX is the show name. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE, the Cube. My co-host Peter Burris. We're live here at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas with two great guests here. Laura Espin, who's the General Manager and Senior Vice President of Oracle Marketing Cloud, and Katie, Kristen O'Hara, Chief Marketing Officer at Time Warner. Kristen, welcome to the Cube. Laura, great to Thank see you. Thank you, great to see you again. So, first of all, the keynote this morning, you guys laid out the marketing future. It's a platform, it's modern customer experience. Not a lot of other things in it, just a simple positioning. Um, tell us more. Sure, well, part of it is around the need for us to deliver things that simplify a marketer's world, not make it more complex, and at the same time, have an opportunity to onboard new innovations and do exciting things so that uh, Time Warner can keep doing the exciting things that they're doing in the, in the world of entertainment. So what we laid out really is a vision around the combination yeah. of both the human element and technology coming together in a powerful way to deliver on the modern marketing experience and really about, for us, putting customers in the center so that our customers can put their customers in the center to create a richer customer experience. And as you know, it's about the, the ability to use data real time, predictive, uh, use new technologies like artificial intelligence uh, to make the, the companies we work with more differentiated and unique, and to take some of the pain points out of uh, implementing so much technology so that they can focus on their customers. Kristen, at Time Warner, you guys are obviously well established, but you have a lot of different groups within Time Warner. Um, there's a data opportunity there. We're in a data-driven marketing world. You're the CMO, how's that working? What's the vision? Are you guys taking advantage of some of these things? If you could share some of the sure, use cases sure. you're doing. So I would say that we believe the companies that create the best quality content and can unlock the power of their data are the companies that are going to own the future. And so for Time Warner, if our content is our most valuable asset, we need to make our data our most competitive advantage. So for us, we set an ambitious goal around data that we wanted to aggregate and monetize the largest set of action, behavior, and intent around the media and entertainment world so that we could become a better, not just marketing organization, but a better company overall because data cuts across so many different areas of an organization that real systemic change is required to fully realize the potential of data. And the innovation on the content side is interesting because content is content, good content always wins, it's a content is king uh, kind of model, but now you have the form factors on the consumption side that's changing very, very fast. So, I, I, internally, how do you guys look at that? Because it's an opportunity to merchandise differently on the content side. Well, I, th I think one of the things that made data rise to the forefront so quickly for us as a company is that historically, data wasn't in our DNA. But as the transformation of media and entertainment is happening, and we're going over the top with products, we have more direct-to-consumer opportunities, and really digital and mobile puts all brands in direct contact with consumers. So we needed to find ways to harness that and do it at scale across our organization. We have three operating companies, right? HBO, Warner, and Turner, and we operate in 200 markets. So for us, the, the opportunity of scale of data to deploy that across marketing, right? We're a large buyer and seller of media over billions of dollars on both sides of that spectrum. Franchise management, we manage giant franchises like DC, Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, Game of Thrones. Distribution, as, as you said, was another big use case for us. How do we think about working with exhibitor partners differently, or MSO partners on the television side differently, retailers in a data-driven world, and ultimately content, whether that's through content personalization, recommendation, or at some point as we get more sophisticated and kind of train our organization to think about how can content inform creative decisions that we make as an enterprise. On the organizational change, it's been a theme all morning, and certainly <coughs> heard this in the keynote. We even heard it from Mark Hurd yesterday a little bit and how he uses his examples of the persona situation um, and identity, but when you have to come in and shake the tree inside the organization for change, it's hard. <laughs> How to, give us a, a peek inside the, yeah. the world of Time Warner on some of the change, because change is, is hard sometimes. So you guys are talking about the journey and the heroes. It is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Were you the hero? What's, give us an update. Are you, are you yeah, almost hero no, status yet? I think that's, that's a terrific question and certainly a huge part of the data transformation was organizational change and it's systemic change, right? It's not about a department. As I said this morning, data's not the job of a department, it's everyone's job, right? And so we need to educate the organization. But I would say in a company like ours, which is a media and entertainment company, you know, we start from a place where, frankly, data is not the most sexy topic for a lot of executives in our organization. You know, Time Warner historically has not been known for internal collaboration around major initiatives. Um, and we, did, we lacked a massive amount of the functional expertise required to realize the power of the possibility. So we knew we had to approach things differently. It could not be business as usual if we were going to get the organizational change required to realize the vision. And so we set what I'll say is three kind of guiding principles that we use. The first was it was about data portability, not centralization, right? It was about how do we get data moving from HBO to Warner, within Warner, over to Turner, et cetera, because we share audiences. The second piece was about uh, make progress, not process. And I think when you tackle a topic as big as data transformation yeah. within a company, people get it shut down or they think we have to have every answer figured out before we go on this journey together. And, and my point was, we need to get started. The world is moving so fast, we need to just test, learn, be agile, and move through the organization. And then the last piece, um, which I said, is, is the data is not a department. And that required a tremendous amount of education yeah. and onboarding. And frankly, that's a place where the Oracle team was really helpful with our you organization. You mean not a department in the sense that everyone owns the responsibility, right. not someone else's job. Well, I, exactly. I think if you park data in IT or you create a data department, you know. It's a crutch. It's a crutch, but yeah. data isn't for data's sake. Data is for business use cases. It's to generate utility. Yeah. Correct. The, the role of the data has value when it's used. Correct. Data has very, very little value when it just sits somewhere. Right. Data swamp. It has the potential to do something, but it's what uh, we, we, we talk about what we call data dynamics, and the idea is that there's a there's a real correspondence between uh, in between things like thermodynamics and information uh, theory. And, and the idea of freeing up data so that it can be used, having it be that potential so that it could be applied, but then actually turning it, liberating it, and turning it into yeah. work is really what we need to focus on. We need to focus on how we're going to turn, how we're going to create more free data that can be applied to work, but really focus on how we're going to put it to work. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think there's a culture shift because you, oftentimes people had data, knowledge, and information, and they felt like uh, they were sitting on it. And you can sit on the data, it's not going to hatch and create something wonderful in terms of growth and ROI. And the same thing goes for when we were talking about heroes and marketing and heroic marketing. Lots of times in the past, if you think about that one-to-many world, there was a hero, there was a great genius of marketing that launched campaigns and was the hero, uh, hero seller, hero marketer. I think one of the things that Kristen shared and also Lisa, the CMO of Tableau Software, was that heroic moments happen in many places around marketing and it only happens because you're able to unleash the data and provide value for the people to use that in their businesses in, in really powerful ways and real time, which is where companies like Time Warner are, are moving and in, at global speed, it's just amazing. One of the things that comes up a lot in our CUBE interviews and recently as DevOps and cloud computing becomes more mainstream, a lot of these concepts are, are starting to hit some of the practitioners in the world is two things, empathy, user empathy, and empowerment, We're back, which is not, it's been around for a while, but now you have a whole new, le new level of empowerment to your sure. point where in the organization, and the Tableau has been great use case here with visualization and wrangling, taking it out of the hands of geeks into the real people on the front lines. That's kind of a theme we're seeing here. How do you guys see that empathy and empowerment? Because what you're really getting at is, if you unleash the data, innovation can come from anywhere in the organization. And, yeah. and the mindset has to be ready for that. I think, I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, we started with marketing as use case one to prove the value proposition because we market at significant scale across our three businesses and to prove that portability worked. As soon as we started to prove that it was driving demonstrable business results, people in the organization started to wake up and take notice. Mm -hmm. And then you start to say, well, what else can we be doing with data? Where our first year was just getting, trying to get people to understand why it mattered. 
I think as we kind of got into yeah. year two of this initiative, people would come to us with ideas and say, well, how can we work with exhibitors differently now? An AMC or a Regal, or how can we work with, you know, um, Amazon or Google differently to kind of unlock data in ways that we so hadn't it changed done your business before. practice mindset. It did, and, and I often say that the, that data has been a catalyst for change in so many areas of our business because people immediately see mm -hmm. the value that it brings. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that was forced. It, it took a lot of organizational change, but once we started to get there, I think you're exactly right. People start to get excited about what's possible with data. Well, the, once you get people excited about data, as long as you keep coming back, at least early, this is, I want to test this with you, as long as you keep coming back to that fundamental touchstone, customer. Correct. Right? Because what's really interesting about this, and, yeah. and, and we, we could, you know, in many respects, we should be talking about the golden age of marketing. Because, you know, we are perhaps moving into this notion of the golden age of marketing. The marketing actually can do an enormous amount of good. But the thing, one of the things that's so interesting is that it is, that customers are now creating enormous amounts of data. And for a company like Time Warner, that is having that continuous interaction as they're focused and you know, uh, focused on your content, that has an enormous implication for getting your organization to focus on the customer that's watching the content and not just the producing of the content. Is, is that also now starting to happen more at Time Warner? Yes, and I, I think we see that in marketing as well as in other areas of the business. So, you know, I used an example this morning with DC Entertainment, a giant franchise of ours across television, films, movies, games, comics. In the past, it was zero-based planning with every new release for us. Today, we've made a concerted effort to collect data at every consumer touch point so we can understand the action, behavior, and intent for the sole purpose of serving those customers better and giving better customer experiences. Whether that means the sequential storytelling in marketing that's as relevant to that person in terms of how they're engaged and where they are at the different life cycles in a particular franchise, or if you take something within HBO, like HBO Now, how can we do better content personalization or recommendation based on your historical patterns, which is something I think consumers are seeking, and frankly getting to a place where they expect that mm -hmm. to be so. So the data can absolutely, yeah. it is about empowering better customer experiences across the board. How do you look at the AI trend? And I was just, we have a story on our site this morning actually about Hollywood and data, because the uh, National Association of Broadcasters show is going right. on here in Las Vegas at the same time. We have uh, our CUBE coverage over there. But you're seeing all aspects of the value chain, not just ticket sales for movies or other things on the merchandising side, but how movies are being made and how shows are being developed. So back to the asset of content. So this is kind of not just marketing, it's evolving into, so if AI does one thing, automates one thing, it will, value will shift somewhere else. Are you guys there yet? Are you guys seeing that internally? Is that something that's being discussed? Marketing discuss? informing production. Is, I don't, I don't know that I would say marketing is informing production. I think what we're seeing is that there's a lot more intelligence we have about how consumers are engaging with our content across various distribution platforms. Laura and I talked a little bit this morning about the role of AI and you know, the threat of machine to man. And I don't necessarily think it's about man versus machine. It's about finding the right, again, use cases for yeah. AI and cognitive systems that can actually free us up to do what we do best, which is create. And you know, what, the, what humans are great at you know, is that creative process and intuition. And I think the more we can automate parts of the, si the system to free up that, mm -hmm. it makes it a more exciting proposition. And I, I think it's different with many companies, but at Oracle we look at artificial intelligence really about intelligent augmentation, right? You, you, yeah. want, to, you want to augment intelligence not replace workers, not replace creativity, but to better inform. So the strategy of building it in, not bolting it on. I do think there's a, a world in the future where artificial intelligence is going to help uh, produce the next product or experience uh, mm -hmm. in a way that we're comfortable with, but really leveraging creativity more than anything yeah. else. And it's just a journey that we're on. And uh, you know, a lot of threat people feel like, well maybe something, a machine or a bot is going to replace my job. 
it should just make us quicker so that if I have an issue and I'm calling into a customer service center, right. I'm not going to get an email at the same time with an offer saying you yeah. must be such a happy customer. Hey, I know we had a problem and at the same time I finished that service call and felt I didn't want to take the survey, yeah. I, they offered me something that, that may extend my loyalty and, th and that's where I think things are The automation is, will certainly do some impact on, on there, but it will shift. And I, I'm not from the school of thought that thinks that it's bad. I mean, people predicted that ATMs would replace bank tellers, yet the banks are opening up more branches than ever before. They're actually hiring more people. And they're selling more things <laughs> so, too. Sure. It's now a retail po component. It could be, get my movies there, download to my phone soon, maybe possibly. Okay, but the big question now is for me is, you guys are doing great. What specifically are you guys using Oracle for? How are you leveraging Oracle? Um, and what's some of the specific examples that you could share? Sure, so as a, I mean, we, we have three operating companies, 200 markets that we operate in. We run hundreds, if not thousands of campaigns every year across our portfolio of brands. And so for us, we really needed a partner who could help us scale quickly in the ability to share data across business units across geographies, across campaigns. But we also needed a partner who could help an organization that was not data first, right? We're not a data native company, and so it's not, it wasn't part of our DNA. So Oracle also played a critical role in helping to get us up, running, and um, markets onboarded. And I think, over the time that we've been working with Laura and the team, you know, the data management platform has been up and running, and I'm delighted to say we've shared you know, billions of consumer profiles across our lines of business that are informing campaigns. So it could be anything So you cross-pollinate data across so organization. Any, so examples would be if we have talent in a particular movie, um, like Dwayne Johnson, who was in San Andreas two years ago, then he was starring two weeks after that in Ballers, and then in Central Intelligence, another Warner release last summer. Our ability to understand that audience base and, and move data from one part of the company to another in real time mm -hmm. is transformational. Another example would be um, Game of Thrones fans had a high propensity to be Batman versus Superman fans last summer. That insight allowed us to market differently both from a messaging standpoint yeah. and a media standpoint in both campaigns. And we're seeing that over and over and over again. And I think we're using first party data to launch every campaign that we're doing, and it really is moved This is how it's supposed to work. First. So talk about how it was before, because I can almost imagine you throwing the dart at the board, not the, I'm oversimplifying it, but the old way was kind of, you gather data as fast as you can, I mean, well, I think in our, in our industry there wasn't really the old way per se yeah. because we didn't <laughs> operate direct to consumer businesses. So before yeah. the onset of digital and technology allowing us to harvest the signal at every consumer touch point, we didn't really have the means mm -hmm. or the mechanism to action whatever data we had. It didn't connect into buying systems. So now that we have the tools, the capabilities, and we, we are direct to consumer in some of our businesses, has changed that. But as I said earlier, I think the whole data transformation has really been a catalyst for change. And a couple of senior executives said to me that exact same question. Well, what did we do before? Yeah. How, how did we do this before? And it was, we didn't, we but we didn't. About like super. <laughs> and we didn't have the capability to do it, even we, if we wanted to. But we talked about it. So, you know, in many respects, it's a back to the future, not a time warner property, I don't believe, but it was a kind of a back to the future moment in that we talked about, you know, going back to the 1930s, the idea of putting the customer at the center of marketing, but we couldn't do it because we didn't have the data. And so it was a stylized thing, but we couldn't actually achieve it. And now, because we have these sources of data, we can in fact put the customer at the center. The question is, yeah. do we as a business have the will to do so? Because it upsets a whole bunch of you know, 80 yeah. years yeah. of other practices and routines because we couldn't put the customer at the center. But so where do you think this is going to go? I, I do think it goes back to the business use case. And once you prove that it works, people listen. Right, it's hard to get them to pay attention before they understand it's going to have demonstrable impact on your business outcomes. And once we started doing that, and it was in the early days of pilot campaigns, which sounded a lot less scary to people yeah, than us saying, this is going to be the new way. We did hundreds of pilots, and I used to joke and say, if there's a 101st pilot, something's wrong <laughs> with our organization. <laughs> we need to be operationalizing. Yeah, we stop at <laughs> exactly. Which I think is important, right? That you, we're living this in this age of pilots, and everyone wants to pilot something. 
that's fine because it's good to pilot and, and check out new innovations, but you have to, pilots have to have a purpose and an attached ROI and you can't just continue to pilot all, all, all your life. Well, so that's the process, progress, it, it, not it, process thing, right? It, it, exactly. I, I would also say when, you know, I was reflecting a little bit about, you know, the era of uh, dominating and marketing and advertising and the, the Mad Men era of the 1960s, we've really moved out of that because we have data to create personalization and moving from the one to many to the one to one to what I talked about, which is the one to you, because I can have unique experiences with Time Warner's content and materials because they'll know how much I want to watch something, what I like to watch, and they'll deliver very unique experiences to me, and they may change some of what they do with content in the future, and I think that's a really exciting place. The data actually creates this new era of sort of like the, the, the uh, not uh, mad men, but math men or math women, because we had all women on the stage today, Great. quite frankly. Uh, but it's exciting, and, and in it's the a modern future, era, modern it is CX. Modern, right? The gold age of marketing should be right here. job this is at Time Warner is for customers to come to her, and I talked about not chasing data, so the customers come to you, and the future world is going to be a you to one. Yeah, and I think she, she nailed I, the, the theme that's coming out in our earlier interviews so far this, this morning was, if you can't get the data, don't base your model around it. It's got to be gettable, you got to have the data. Um, so Laura, I want to ask you with this, with this use case, um, timetable, great transformation, great success at Time Warner. As the GM and Senior Vice President of the modern CX, the modern era of, of data, What's the vision for you as you look at this? Because it, some dots that we can connect is, you see some simplification right. in, the, in the products. Platform is now the key. Can we get to the point where we can stand up campaigns and apps in minutes and weeks, not months? Oh, I think absolutely. And, and companies like Time Warner and Kristen with her vision show how quickly you can move and stand things up and scale. And certainly, the most important thing is to take out complexity, to unleash data, to democratize it, which we've talked about, and then to implement and take our products that actually serve the purposes against a very specific use case and a business ROI. And that's what we're building, and it's not limited to marketing. It's all of customer experience, because you can't live in a mm -hmm. silo from every touch point. We're cross-channel, we're fully integrated. We have more mm -hmm. data as a tech company combined with Marketing Cloud than anyone else. Yeah. And my job is to make sure I serve customers <laughs> like Kristen well, so uh, we can talk to her, and I can <laughs> cookie cutter this, and we can, we can uh, someone may be able to follow How long her. did it take? She, they came in from the beginning, transformed? I think I, it's, it's really been a three year journey at Time Warner, but we didn't necessarily start with picking our technology partners. Part of the piloting process was understanding more about technology, more about the skills that were required within our organization or that we needed to outsource, and the process that we needed to go through, and improving the business outcomes, to your point, that the pilots with purpose, and we had a, a use case for each pilot, as it were. And I think through the end of that first year, which, which we call kind of the pilot phase, we really started to zero in on, we needed technology at scale to really scale the, the initiative um, quickly within our organization. And we also think about partners very differently. In this world, it is about figuring out the balance of what you need to take internally and where you're going to bring on and lean yeah. on partners and kind of outsource that technology and really be in it together. I mean, Laura's team has been to 26 yeah. markets with me launching this around the world and I think that speaks volumes because we have small territories that would never be able to yeah. do it without that scale of the enterprise-wide effort. I got to ask both of you um, this question because I had a chance to sit down with Mark Hurd and talk about with, with Mark about the, this topic and it was interesting, his response was, because he's old school um, CEO, um, is millennials. You have younger people coming into the workforce both as customers and as employees. So they don't want to work for some you know, old shop. They want to work for something that they're used to. So they tend to have a reaction of, why are we doing that way? So can you comment about this new generation because they do kind of put a little bit more pressure to be agile, to be um, modern, and so it's also, they're also your customers <laughs> want to consume That's in a right. new way. That's Talk right. about this new dynamic, because it's, it's forcing, is it a forcing function, or how does that play into it? Is there any comments? In my business, it's really, in all of Oracle, it's really about creating spaces for people to explore and learn and to cross-pollinate, whether it's millennials and, and you know, people who have been in the business for 10, 20, 30 years. 
that's the most important thing is that people have a willingness to learn. We talked about lifelong learning and cross-pollination yeah. and creating spaces. And I think we attract the best talent no matter what age and background. If we're doing things that are exciting, and that my team sees success in companies yeah. like Time Warner, that they're learning and they're, they're excited about <laughs> seeing the future yeah. of a company like Time Warner be on the cutting edge of digital and moving as quickly as they have. With all the planning, I mean, it's tremendous what Chris and her team have accomplished and yeah. we're, we're happy to be a small part of that. Laura, well, congratulations on having such a great Thank customer, you. Kristen. Great story. Thanks for sharing Thank the Time you. Warner perspective here on the Cube. Us. This is the Cube here, live at the Mandalay Bay. I'm John Furrier with Peter Burst. We wrap up with more after this short break, live in Las Vegas. <laughs>